So we're going to be beginning uh, a new sermon series, a short four-week series um, that will lead us right up to the Christmas Advent season. And if you can believe that, it's four weeks away. And I don't know if you've seen the memes recently, but uh, it looks like you need to have a jet ski or a boat to get your Christmas presents because they're all in the harbors or out in the oceans uh, on cargo ships. So hopefully you've uh, already got your jet ski ready to go for that. But um, the holidays are quickly coming, and tomorrow is uh, November 1st, and just blows me away how fast that's coming. Um, but our series is called Four Faith Journey Pillars. And as you can see uh, behind me, um, that's our, the series that we are in. And after our newcomers class a few weeks ago, um, I really felt God leading me to teach about four important teachings and practices of the church. And when I say the church, not the church of God, but God's church, the whole, the whole church, that help us grow and walk in a closer relationship with the Lord. When I decided to use the word pillars, I wasn't necessarily thinking of the pillars that, you know, hold up the Parthenon as, as Steve and Diane just went to Greece not too long ago and saw the Parthenon and saw pictures of it. And, you know, it's columns surrounding it. And if one of those columns were to fall down, potentially the entire building would collapse and fall, fall down. I don't necessarily think that these four practices, these truths, are holding up your, your entire faith structure. And if one comes down, your entire faith will just collapse and topple down. I don't believe that. But that G, because I know that Jesus is our cornerstone. And that as long as your relationship with Jesus, the cornerstone that holds up your structure, is sound and strong, your faith will last the test of time. I feel like these four pillars, though, that we're going to be discussing are like more like those tall, beautiful homes in like the south, those southern plantation homes. And, and Cindy, I have a picture of one. When I think of these pillars that I'm talking about, I think they're more like this picture behind me, these four pillars that if one of those fall down, yeah, your roof is probably going to collapse, but your whole house isn't going to fall down. And these pillars um, help keep the roof tall, the ability to keep the roof tall. They extend the roof out, and they hold up the porch to block the weather elements from hitting your front door. These pillars have a similar purpose that we're going to be discussing. They build your faith. They expand your relationship with Jesus, who is your cornerstone. These pillars help us to give us a better defense uh, against whatever outside elements may come against you in this world. And as we all know, and as I prayed earlier, there are elements that are going to attack us constantly uh, in a barrage at times or in a drizzle at times uh, throughout our entire journey in this life. So what is the first pillar that we're going to be talking about this morning? Well, as you might have seen when you first walked in, um, I have communion elements set up in the front, and it is the last Sunday of the month, and every last Sunday of the month, uh, we do communion here at 1COG. And uh, that is what we're going to be talking about today is communion, our first pillar of this series. What is communion? Why do we take it? Is it really something that we must do in our life? How can, how can communion really build our faith? I mean, it's just juice and bread. And I'm not sure that's actually bread. I hope to answer these questions that we're going to be discussing this morning. I remember as a kid, uh, when we would have communion, uh, growing up, this, this congregation would only do communion about, I don't know, maybe four times a year. And... Um, it would be like every season we'd do like uh, every fall, winter, spring, summer, we'd have communion. And I remember begging my mom, looking at my mom, be like, hey, can, we, can I have communion as a child, as a little kid? Can I take it? Can I take it? Can I take it? And my mom would be like, no, 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 you're not old enough. And later on, she kind of explained to me, well, you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior yet. You have to be a Christian to take communion. And I had said something like, well, I go to church. That, sorry, that's not, that doesn't make you a Christian. You have to accept Jesus in your heart. And soon, soon enough, uh, I, the long-awaited day came, and I accepted Jesus in my heart, and it was not quite as I imagined it to be. I mean, Jesus' blood and body tasted a lot like grape juice and stale bread. 
didn't seem as spectacular as the pastor had made it out to be as he talked about the communion and the elements. And so growing up for me, communion was kind of, for me, just saying it's for me, just a church tradition that we did every so often to kind of be like, okay, well, I'm following Jesus' command of breaking bread with one another. And so it's kind of more of a checklist. And then I went to college uh, at an evangelical free uh, university, and it was a big, big deal at the institution I attended. And they practiced it a lot. They talked about it a lot. We probably took communion once a week um, as students. And I was so confused. I was like, oh, my word. I'm like, we never took communion. It wasn't a big deal. And now it's like every week we're taking communion. This is like, I'm like, it's kind of making it seem like not as important. When you do something over time a lot, it kind of makes it not as special. It just becomes a routine. And then they even had me read all sorts of different books. And I remember this book. And it, I mean, once I tell you the story, you'll know why it stuck out with me. Uh, there's this book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. And there's a Catholic priest uh, who's, re- who's uh, writing this book, Brendan Manning. And in this book, he recounts, uh, he tells his readers that he became an alcoholic. Well, I'm reading this book, and, and they're like, okay, this guy's an alcoholic. I'm like, oh, now it's got my attention. I'm like, okay, why? what's going on? How's this Catholic priest an alcoholic? And he said that uh, in his story that he became an alcoholic because he believed that the blessed symbolic blood of Christ should never be drained down a drain. Should never be dumped down a drain. And so he drank every drop of the communion wine because he didn't want to spill or waste the blood of Christ. Symbolic blood of Christ. So he became an alcoholic because he didn't want any drop of that wine to be wasted. That was blessed. And so you see these two extremes. And I'm like, okay, well, where should we be? (laughs) What should we believe in this? Who's right? Well, I think it needs to be somewhere in the middle. But... I do believe with all my heart that communion is something that we should desire to do as Christians, as followers of Jesus. Communion should be something that we hunger and thirst for, pun intended. Wake up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jesus commanded us to partake in it. Why? Because the practice is good for building our faith. Communion the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, it's, it's a powerful experience. It's a meal that touches not your belly, but your soul. Through communion, we are invited to a meal that ma- is made of redemption and release. You see, Jesus' Last Supper, as we see in Matthew and, and all the Gospels, or in a majority of the first three Gospels, as it's recounted, was Jesus having dinner with his disciples as they celebrated the Passover feast. And there was not a, it, that's not a coincidence that the Passover is happening and Jesus chose the Passover feast to, to have his Lord's Supper in, to have the Lord's Last Supper in. For 1,500 years, the Passover had been uh, teaching God's people that man's great need, of man's great need and, and God's great salvation. This sacred observance at Passover looks back to God's deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt in bondage and in slavery. And so, uh, and, and also the Passover feast is a, is a celebration of God, um, the, Passover, uh, the Passover lamb, when, when, they, when they put blood over the doorposts and, and the, uh, losing it, the angel of death who went by and, and spared uh, spared all of the Israelites who had the blood over the doorposts and took all the firstborn uh, from that land. It was a celebration of God's uh, providence over them. The custom was drawn from four promises made by God to Israel in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. And these were those four promises. I will bring you out of Egypt. I will free you from being slaves. I will redeem you. And I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. This Passover feast and celebration was precious to Jesus because it reminded him, it reminded his disciples of who God is. It reminded people that sin is a life in bondage. Just as the people of Israel were in Egypt, sin is a slavery. It's like doing the work of slavery, or as they 
probably were doing in Egypt, building those bricks, the endless job of continuing to build those bricks and to stack bricks and to build bricks and do all the things that they were doing, it's, that's what sin is. It's an endless task, a never-ending task of bondage. It reminds them that death will pass over every house and our only protection lies not in, tra- in our traditions and our, or our own abilities, but in the blood of the Lamb. This Passover feast is a reminder that God is a redeeming God. That He purchased us out of slavery. He's a liberating God. Sending us out victoriously and sending the people of the Israelites out safe toward the land of milk and honey, which He does the same for us. Jesus brings His disciples to the Passover meal on the eve of His death to reveal to them that He is the fulfillment of of that Passover feast. As I studied this morning, nothing became more clear to me that I want to make sure that you understand that when you read the communion, that Jesus was signifying that, if you remember that story, as I just said, that they used to put blood, they put blood over the doorposts, and the angel would go past them and spare their family. Jesus is his blood, his symbolic, his death is our Passover lamb. That when his blood covers us, we have spiritual life. It's amazing, the symbolism and how Jesus was able to work this all together. Communion invites us to a meal that exposes our hearts. As I said, the story of Jesus' Last Supper is in all three of the first three Gospels, and I'm focusing mainly on Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 through 30. So if you want to kind of just semi-following along, I'm not going to read it, but if you want to kind of follow along with the story with me this morning. It was a strange dinner that Jesus had. He drives one guest away, Judas. He leaves every one of his disciples unsettled, feeling like, what's happening? What, I don't, what is going on? And even Jesus leaves with a broken heart. But that's what communion does. Communion exposes all hearts. At this meal, the pretender cannot hide Jus saw Judas' heart, and what no one else could see in Judas, Jesus saw right through it. He saw the heart of a betrayer and a liar. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 27 32, Paul issues this solemn warning that this is a meal that we should take seriously, that when we take communion, we need to check into our hearts, look at our hearts, look at our minds, see where we are. Because if it's taken in an unworthy manner, it can bring sickness, and it even says to kill you. And so, what does that necessarily mean for us? It means that fakes and frauds are exposed through communion. Through communion, every follower of Christ must invite the Lord to examine our hearts and our minds. There are two questions that I invite every single one of you in this room to ask every time, we, every time we come to the Lord's table. Here's the first one. Am I in a right relationship with Jesus Christ this morning or before I take communion? It's the first one. And the second one. Am I in a right relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ? The scripture warns us to examine our souls. So why those two questions? Why do we have to be in a right relationship with Jesus? to take communion, and why do we need to be in a right relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Because taking communion, or or sorry, have you ever had a dinner with someone when your relationship wasn't right? Taking communion when a relationship isn't right is like having an affair in the afternoon and then going home to your spouse in the evening, acting like everything is okay. Communion is a sacred celebration to be honored. When you come to the Lord's table, this sacred celebration and and, um, remembering what Jesus did, and you come with a a heart that is not right, it's like you're cheating on what Jesus did for you. You're cheating. You're not being wholly focused and surrendered to the one who were celebrating his blood and his body that was spilled and broken for you. The stunning news that a betrayer was among them, as Jesus was telling in the story, grieved the disciples greatly. But it was also very interesting to me that it also prompted them to ask this question, Surely not I, Lord. Surely it's not me that's going to betray you. 
And it was a question in which they expected Jesus to say, no, of course not. Not you, Peter. Not you, uh, James. No, no way. But Jesus didn't. In fact, that while, the, uh, while only Judas was the one that would betray them, they all would forsake Jesus. He eventually told them in verse 31 that this very night you will all fall away on account of me. John tells us that his disciples move very quickly from surely not I, Lord, to an argument about who would be the greatest. Did you catch that? They, they argue, no, I would never abandon you, Lord. I, oh, you are the king of all kings. Lord, who's, I'm, I'm the greatest. Tell me, Jesus, I'm the best, right? Jesus, I'm the best. Tell me, right? That's me, right? There's a sense in which this meal is intended to bring out our worst. Not provoked in bad behavior, not bad behavior, but it reveals our selfish, sinful desires that still dwell inside of us. What kind of people were invited to this meal? Who's invited to God's, who's God's dinner guest? Friends, it's people like you and me. People who hunger for more of God, but yet struggle every day to live for Him. Those are who are, inv who are invited to God's table. People who have been given victory in Christ, but yet long for more love and more power from everyone we come around. It is a meal that exposes each of our hearts at, at, at the table, at Jesus' table, but it also exposes the heart of Christ who found fellowship and love and desires to be with us, who still don't get it all the time. Through communion, we're invited to a meal that feeds our deepest spiritual hunger. Bread without yeast is a biblical symbol of holiness. All, all throughout in the Jewish custom, there's always unleavened bread. Okay, And there's a reason why there was unleavened bread, because yeast is an image of something that puffs up and ultimately spoils bread. Jesus is, for us, it's like we're, when we go after Jesus, it's like we're dining on his holiness. Communion is a food for our souls that never spoils. That often, it strengthens us. It nourishes righteousness inside of us and the grace that's deep down inside of us, within us. It, it nurtures all of that and grows it. Because we hunger for God, we can become more holy and more like God's character. Because we hunger for God, the meal carries the promise of eternity with Him. In communion we're, are contained both the promise of redemption and also the promise of a reunion with Jesus. And it is that promise that sustains us and feeds our soul's deep hunger for hope. We come to this simple communion meal again and again, once a month, because it's a meal that feeds our deepest hunger. It gives us strength for our life's journey and builds our relationship with God and gives us hope for the eternity to come. In our tradition, we usually regard communion as a memorial. And keeping with Jesus' statement, do this in remembrance of me, and that table is covered uh, with a drape, but it says, in remembrance of me. And I'm sure a lot of you went to a church, maybe grew up in a church where you always saw that table in the front that says, do this in remembrance of me. And that's where that comes from. Jesus commands, it's a communion table that commands us to do this, to take this, to partake in this in remembrance of Jesus and what he did. But over the years, I've grown increasingly certain that what happens in the mystery of communion is more than just a memorial of remembering what Jesus did. It's more than that. It's a meal that in some mysterious way goes beyond and goes beyond my understanding and it, because it brings health to our souls. It nourishes our souls. It goes much further than just remembering what Jesus did. When we take communion, we're also reminded to look back. We remember each time we take, we remember each time we take communion, the Last Supper, when Jesus made that solemn promise to make us his redemptive people. Then he was betrayed, tortured, agonizing in death, which all allowed for his new covenant to be established in each of our lives. The new covenant. Looking back, 
makes us realize that our God delivers on his promises. He promised deliverance to the children of Israel, and he provided it. He promised a Savior to this world, not just for the Jews, but for the whole world, and he provided it. We look back to remember what Jesus did for each one of us. That's one of the reasons why I love communion times. It's not just because I'm checking a box off now in my faith. I do it because I know that it gives me an opportunity to remember what he has done in my life. What he has sacrificed in my life. And what he did so that I could have a relationship with him. And so we get this awesome opportunity to look back at who we once were without him. And who he has made us in him. Even though we don't deserve it. He bled and died for each one of us. Wow. Looking back, it strengthens our faith and encourages us to hold fast to all of God's promises that he's given us. I love a promise for that comes from Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 through 15. I want to read it to you. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of change, charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. All our sins forgiven, our slates wiped clean and the old death warrants canceled on our behalf and was nailed to the cross for each one of us. That's the mighty power that the cross freely is given to each one of us. We come to communion not to boast of who we are, but to remember it is the mighty power of the cross that brings us here in this relationship. We come not because we are strong and have conquered death, we come because we've experienced the life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ because he conquered death. We come not because our faith is great, but because our faith is in a mighty, amazing God. When we take communion, we look around, friends. Communion is not just an individualistic Act only, and I know that's a lot of times how we perceive it as, oh, just take your time between you and God. But the word communion actually means joining together. As each of you takes communion, we are saying to one another, as brothers and sisters in Christ, I, like you, was a sinner saved by the grace of God. I'm with you. I, like you, love Jesus. I, like you, need the continuing renewing of the power of the Holy Spirit to be in my life. So, because we have that common ground, let us serve the Lord together. When we take communion, we also look forward, and this is my favorite part of communion, there are three great feasts ordained in the history of the people of God. The first, one is already, the first two have already occurred. Number one, the Passover of Moses that we've talked about earlier. The second one, the Lord's Supper of Jesus Christ that we're celebrating right now. And the third great feast event that is yet to happen is the marriage feast of the Lamb of God, Jesus. Each time the children of Israel took the Passover meal, they were affirming their belief in the coming of the promised Savior to save them. Each time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're affirming our belief in the return of Jesus. Each communion we celebrate in one Commun that we are one communion closer to the meeting Jesus. Do you ever think about that? Every time you take communion, you're celebrating, oh, I'm one more communion closer to having that marriage feast with my Lord and Savior. Longing for that moment. With all, and having that experience, celebrating that feast with Jesus and celebrating that feast with all those who have gone before us who we love that were with Jesus. What a feast that will be yet on that day. It just doesn't pale in comparison to being able to see Jesus on that day. The one who made it all possible. The one who bled. The one who broke his body for you so that you could have eternal life. 
even though as much as I long to see those people that have gone before me, those ones that I miss, those ones that I, I love dearly, there's nothing that I'm gonna, that's going to stop me from running and falling at his feet. The one who gave his life so that I could have eternal life and have a life that I'm meant to have. And that's what communion reminds us of. The Lord's Supper is, is an appropriate occasion for rejoicing. A lot of times it's a, it's a tearful exchange. It's a tearful crying of, oh, I, uh, woe, I've done wrong and Jesus saved me. But I'm telling you, friends, it's a time of rejoicing for who he's made you and what he's done for you. It speaks of the sins forgiven of the resurrected coming king so that we can joyously proclaim his eternal victory over death. And he's going to return one day to fulfill his covenant to us and his promise to us. Dwayne, you can go ahead and make your way forward, please. We're going to take communion now. And I hope maybe this has kind of answered some of those questions and cleared up why we do some of the things we do, why communion is so important. And so, you know, it's a time of, again, it's, it's a time of looking in the past. It's a time of looking at the future. It's a time of looking at what Jesus has done in your life. It's a precious time. It's a glorious time. It's a time of filling your soul and not your belly. It's not to bring nourishment to your body, but it's to bring nourishment to your soul. And this morning, I wonder, where are you this morning? Where are you this morning? What does Jesus want to do, to you, want to do for you this morning? He's already given his life for you, but he wants to continue. That's how amazing he is. You get that? That's how amazing that he is. He not only gave his life for you, and he doesn't stop there. He's not like, oh, I've already given you your present. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm checked out. I'm done. He's like, no, I'll do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. What's it going to get to get you to have that relationship with me? What do I have to do? I've already died and bled for you, but I'm willing to go the distance. I'm willing to go the distance. What's it going to take this morning? Because I want to make it happen for you this morning. And that's what Jesus is saying this morning. I want you to see that. I want you to see this communion. I want you to rejoice with your brothers and sisters. I want you to be rejoicing for what Jesus did for, me, for you. And that's what Jesus wants this morning. So as we take this communion, I'm, I want to invite everyone. <clears throat> you can come up and you'll come up through the middle aisles. as uh, We're going to sing a song first. But then we're, you're going to come up through the middle aisles. And um, if you'd like to pray with your family... If you want to come up and pray by yourself, I'd like you to kind of come along this direction and make your way back. Even if you're on this side, keep, go this direction and you can make it back to your seats. You can pray on the altars here. You can, you can go in a corner. You can do whatever you want. And you can pray by yourself. Again, you can pray with the family, uh, whatever, a friend. But this is if you, just want to, if you just want to pray together. But if any of you want a special prayer time with me, I, as I've told you guys before, I, I want to pray with you. And so, for those of you that want special prayer with me and want to do some uh, major work and you want some help, you want some backup uh, in your in backup for you, I'm here and I want to pray with you over here. Or I'll anoint you or whatever, um, whatever need you may have, that's, that's on this side. And so we're going to sing this song and uh, I, I just want you guys to spend this time evaluating your heart, letting this time Letting God, the Spirit, speak to you about what you need to correct, what you need to make right, what you need to surrender, what you need to do in order to, to be the, have the relationship with Jesus that he desires, that he died for you to have. And so if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've accepted him in your heart, not saying that you're perfect and that you're this sinful or this, uh, this righteous, holy person that has not sinned. I'm not saying that. But if you've accepted Jesus in your heart, then communion is for you. This is for you. You don't have to be a member of our church. You just have accepted Jesus. That's the only requirement that we see from Scripture. So if you've accepted Jesus, this, this is for you. Celebrate the Lord's Supper. Examine your heart. 